Hello, Edu Magicians. Welcome to the Edu Magic Podcast with your host, Dr. Sam Fesich. Dr. Sam is a professor of education, author of Edu Magic, and a pumpkin spice latte fan. This podcast is designed for pre service teachers. Remember, friends, teaching doesn't begin at graduation, but during that first class at 8 a.m. Let's get this party started. I'm Jesse Lubinsky, host of the Partial Credit Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello, Edu Magicians, and welcome to a bonus episode of the Edu Magic Podcast. My name is Dr. Sam Fesich, and today I'm going to be sharing with you the Kappa Delta Pi Teaching During the Age of COVID webinar series. Now, this webinar series was hosted two weeks ago by Kappa Delta Pi, and it was all about best practices, strategies, tech tool tips, and cleaning practices to get into when it when you get into student teaching or into your teaching placement. So let's jump right into the webinar. Okay, thank you so much, Thomas. Um, Good evening, everyone. My name is Mandy Jane Antwine, and I am a former National Student Teacher of the Year, um, but I currently am the owner of Antwine's Academics, LLC, which is a private instruction and consulting business in Birmingham, Alabama. I'd like to thank each of you for coming to join us this evening. We know that you could have trusted anyone to give you guidance on how to take on this upcoming fall during the age of COVID, but we are so grateful that you trusted us. And um, as educators, we're used to being able to be quick to think on our feet, but it's also a good way to learn from other people. Um, Tonight's panelist, we have Frederick Yakey, who is the Vice President of Providence Cristo Rey High School. Um, We also have Crystal Strubin, who is the President and CEO of At Your School. We also have Dr. Samantha Fisich, um, who is an Assistant Professor of Education and Instructional Technologist at Grove City College. We also have Ms. Brittany Caldwell, um, who is a teacher at Cedar Grove High School in the areas of special education and social studies. First, we will hear from Mr. Frederick Yakey. Um, he will be sharing um, different pieces of insight that he gained during the spring and how we can apply it during the fall, during the age of COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Yakey, I'll allow you to take it away, please. And please introduce yourself. I'm off the mute now. Thank you so much, Mandy, for the opportunity to be here. And I certainly greet everyone. We have a phenomenal group of individuals that are very um, knowledgeable about the places and certainly the time frame that we're in. A little bit about myself. Um, I certainly love talking about myself, so I'll keep it short. Um, (laughs) Native of Indianapolis, grew up up here. um, Here in the inner city, was blessed to have a mother and father to uh, rear me in the direction that I should go. Um, graduated from a uh, inner city high school, was blessed to go to college on a March Advanced Scholarship down at Kentucky State University. Um, from there, I uh, started some grad school work and came back home and started running after school programs. Um, found I had a love for passion and giving back and went back and got a few graduate degrees in teaching. Um, and through many opportunities in public charter, now in private schools, I've been able to serve in administrative roles. Uh, more recently, I, I've served as interim president of Providence Crystal Ray, now I'm vice president. Uh, Providence Crystal Ray is a national private school starting in Chicago. We have about 37 schools across the country, and we focus on getting kids who cannot afford a private school experience an opportunity to afford that through the vehicle of corporate work study. Um, so I've had the privilege of not only educating students uh, to change their trajectory by going to college, first generation, but also partnering with many of corporate America jobs, making sure that our students can have meaningful work and that can close the gap of inequities. I want to talk about a few things of, of, of what I found that was very useful when COVID-19 took place. I often tell people that no one was prepared uh, when COVID-19 happened. When you were watching the news, you had so many, so many different things out there. You had information was really a big thing. Um, You had information from both federal, um, depending on where you lived at, state was giving you differently. And then if you live in a county or a city, you had different information as well. 
Um, for many schools, K through 12 or secondary, you have certain guidelines that everyone was trying to work with. Um, so I put contingency plans. Um, randomly, this was something that we had to prepare on the slide. Um, we were told literally um, Monday that school may be closing for a three week period of time. Don't let anyone go home Tuesday without their laptops. Now, that if your school is one that has laptops, that's not an issue, but many of our students didn't. Many of our students didn't have internet, so what do you do? We had to develop with some type of contingency plan where we not only take care of our families, but also take care of our staff because they also have meaningful work. Um, the third, the second point that I really came to my mind is that we have to talk about safety. Um, and I put as a under bullet there for many educators, you have grades versus grace, right? And I put that there because I quickly found that many of our students and scholars, um, it did not just relate to education anymore. It was about survival, right? And as educators, you wanna make sure that you understand the society that we're teaching in. We also have to understand that everyone's home is not the same. I can expect one of my parents that is a single mother that has three kids in three different school districts or three different schools, secondary, middle school, and elementary to literally keep up with work when she has to have a job. And because I have a high school, many of my students have to be the ones to make sure the younger kids do it. That means that they probably won't log on until later on in the evening, if at all. So we quickly had to understand that I know this is what we normally would do if it wasn't COVID, but we have to have a level of grace because we have to understand the society and the times that we're in. So much so, you find out later in my presentation, that our, our, our whole culture and, and our whole process of philosophy of teaching shifted. We started to do Google surveys to find out, number one, which of our families don't even have internet. Two, can we partner with some of the agencies to offer hotspots? Three, who does not have food? Mm. We had to link in the social services and our Wednesdays terms to us to delivering food items to people because they were hungry, lights were getting turned off. So we had to literally educate totally different than what we normally would when there was school because kids were missing lunches. They were missing opportunities to have positive interactions with people. And secondly, many of them were going to environments that were tough. The third part I put was virtual learning. It was on the job training. Um, we started school being a school that did not offer virtual training at all. And all of a sudden we had to pivot. And we found that we had to learn on the fly on what virtual learning is. And we, we were very clear. We were very clear. We said, well, we have distant learning. Right, mm -hmm. distant learning means that we're going to offer these things via Zoom and we're going to teach and this is the schedule. My principals and vice principals did a wonderful job of creating these types of schedules that were modified, but also work with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis to make sure that they were available, to make sure that they can log on. But I remember one of my mentors once told me he was the superintendent of Indianapolis Public Schools. Um, and he once stood up and he told us, he said, what do you do when your lesson plans fail? You stay up all night, you practice, you build in every intricate detail, you imagine the joy and excitement of when students see it. You know, it's, it, it's that look when you get the light bulb. What happens when you do all of that and you pass out the test and everyone fails? Do you blame the students or do you go back and say, okay, the lesson plan didn't fail. I have to do something else to make them teach. So when your lesson plan fails, then you teach the lesson. So that's me right there. I, at the time I was, I was the president and we needed a bus driver and we had to practice social distancing and we partnered with some of the local agencies. And we realized that as we were going to drop off the food, we were also checking on the ones that have not logged on because we had to take attendance and many of the students weren't logging on. And we went to the homes and we began to see what was going on, what were the necessary needs. And those wellness checks literally helped our engagement to rise. We were able to work with our parents on a one-on-one -on -one level and not just see why they weren't learning or why they weren't responding. And also we were able to help out with other needs and assistance. That helped out with us knowing a couple of things. Number one, we understood that our families needed a sense of community and they needed someone to check on. Two, for our 
English as second language students, we were able to see what other needs or assistance that they needed because our population of students were in Indianapolis were the ones that are being impacted the most by COVID. So that allowed us to use our mission as the platform, not only for recruiting, but for retaining our students and keeping them fully engaged. Thankfully, all of our seniors were able to graduate because of that level of engagement and that level of retention. So lessons learned, um, just very brief and quickly, um, some of the lessons learned is that number one, you have to have a plan for the plan. Um, when I was interim president, we I had a contingency plan, and the first thing that I had to do, I had to get my board involved. I had to literally bring in emergency board meetings. I had to activate others, and I had to come up and create an emergency vision plan or a plan that was COVID-related, that this is what it looked like when it was regular, but I had to activate others that had oversight, that had other reaches in the community to bring in support. And what we found is that when you acted in a more urgent manner earlier, you were able to sustain some of the blows, particularly our schools are private schools. So many of the schools and students that we were able to uh, work with, we were able to bring in more supports once the community got involved. So to this day, we were able to plan better because we went through something in the fall or spring rather. We went through something in the spring where we weren't able to really hold on to a lot of people. We lost uh, data, we lost uh, computers. So we had to really re-up. We had to train, we had to develop. And that contingency plan, even now, we're preparing for any given moment, we can have an outbreak. We started school last Wednesday. So any given moment, we can close down. When we close down, then what? So that allowed us to prepare. Training for educators is number two. We had to have more training and more relevant training because many of our teachers had a sense of, I'm not gonna say insecurity, but they did not feel as empowered enough because you know what? Our teachers have families too. They have children. They have young children that they're worrying about. So we wanted to bring in trainers. So we really worked with our social worker and we brought in some outside counseling to support our educators and teachers. Because at the end of the day, we don't make sure that we are healthy. We can't expect to educate healthy. And I know a lot of times while we are educators, we sometimes can wear the cape, whether you're a male or female, you might be superwoman or you might be superman, or if you like Marvel, you might be, um, I don't know, Black Panther, somebody out there. But a lot of times the heroes need to be taken care of. And, when, and what we found as we did our survey we found that many of our staff didn't feel supported, nor did they feel loved. And the third thing is that we had to continue to support our families by bringing them in, making sure that they're involved, and over-communicate on what our plans of reopening was. So we have many different scenarios. You have every school district doing things differently. We had to over-communicate not only in English, but in Spanish, what our plans were, and give them the option. If they did not feel safe, here's the plan for you to learn from home. Right. We let them know that they are empowered with the choice because everyone is impacted. And lastly, the community. Uh, if, 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 if I didn't learn anything else, COVID-19 really brought a sense of community back in the neighborhoods. Uh, with the movie theaters closed, with a lot of things out, it closed a lot of distractions. Well, we're going back to a level of community, but that also can bring um, some more opportunities for us to be more of a community focused school. So we brought those things involved. We opened up more of our transportation options. And hopefully through the lessons that we've learned through educating through COVID, it's prepared us to be a better um, institution. Thanks, Mandy. And thanks, uh, Thomas, for your time. Yes, thank you. And uh, Mr. Yankee, if you have a moment, I actually have a question to kind of follow up with what you shared. Thank you so much for everything. You you touched on your teachers and them feeling some sort of insecurity, which I think that most of the teachers who are listening to us tonight, they do have a sense of insecurity because they feel as though they're not fully prepared yes. to take on what they're facing right now. So what is your advice as an administrator to teachers, no matter their level, whether it be primary or at the graduate level, what is your advice on setting realistic expectations for themselves as well as their students, regardless of socioeconomic status? Absolutely, that's a great question. And I'm gonna say something that many leaders fail to do, you must be transparent. I found that transparency, as you are setting these expectations, people value because you share the same concerns. So what we've done, we've invited think partners and other teachers and educators to help us think through plans in every scenario. 
And one of the things that came out of one of the surveys that we did was a teacher said, well, I have a child and when my child's school closes, I don't have any daycare. I'm concerned that if I don't come to work, I'll lose a job. So we had to think through when schools close, how can we create and work with our teachers to come through with a plan that can support them? And that level of transparency really brought a more a level of community with our teachers where we can have more supports. So one of the things that I would encourage every leader to do is to be very transparent in things that you know, things that you don't know, and things that you're working out, you're still learning. Um, one, of, one, one of my early failures, I will say, is that I didn't open up to be transparent early enough. And that didn't bed well. Even though I uh, communicated where we were going, I didn't communicate what I don't know um, where this path can lead us to. And that really could have really shifted some things. So working with our educators, and then second thing, self-care. Um, I, I, I think it's very important that as you provide these services for families, we need to provide them equally for our teachers because the stress, um, the fear, the whole nine, you will know no matter how well of an educator you are, when you are thinking about things personally, it comes off in your instruction, right? And if it comes off in your instruction, the students that are receiving it feel it before they hear it. Yeah. Right. That's why education is so much of a calling. If you're called to do something, you literally are almost ministered into those kids. But whatever you are comes out. So we learned that we had to stop, really dial back because the kids are panicking. It's different. You ought to see us. We hear social distancing. Everyone has a mask on. They, they can't eat lunch with other people. We check in temperatures coming off the bus. So it's so different. But if there's no sense of normalcy, whether you're doing it via camera or you're in front of them, you have to give a level of peace and say, hey, everything's going to be OK. Now let's pull out your books and turn to chapter seven so we can teach. Excellent. Thank you so much. Transparency is key. Definitely. So thank you so much for that. Absolutely. In addition to speaking about things as administrators, we will kind of transition our discussion over to Ms. Strubin, who will discuss safety in the age of COVID-19. Ms. Strubin, if you would please just introduce yourself as well as your topic and share some different safety tips that you learned as far as how to handle things as a school setting during COVID-19. Thank you so much, Mandy, and thank you, uh, Frederick, for sharing those lessons learned during COVID. We've all learned a lot of lessons over the past several months, so it's nice to be together to share that information. So my name is Crystal Strubin, and I'm the president and CEO of AYS at your school. We operate uh, on-site programs within school buildings, both before and after school and when school is not in session. Uh, my background um, from an education and experience perspective is in communications, leadership, and business. I spent my career in the nonprofit sector, uh, serving women, family, and children organizations, serving organizations, um, both focusing on health and, and education. So this organization fits right into my background and my passion. Um, I've been in this role for six years. I'm the second CEO um, of AYS since it was founded 40 years ago. Um, and while I've been in leadership positions uh, for many years, dealing with many different types of challenges, I'll say that uh, COVID-19 definitely um, requires all of us to bring our A game to the table. Um, so in this time, I'm gonna talk about uh, safety, open communication and leadership, similar to Frederick. I think those are key themes that are important in this time. So in order to make the best decisions, I'll, um, encourage each of you to really make sure that your school leaders or yourself are monitoring local media and key local and state websites. Um, so you want to look at local and state health department websites, your state's FSSA website, and also ensuring that you're in touch with what your local mayor and your governor is saying about health and safety during this time. And so I'm going to focus really on how you serving professionals like all of us uh, can provide a safe learning environment for youth while we're also maintaining our own safety at this time. I'll tell you a little bit about space planning. We'll talk about cleaning protocols, um, we'll go over health screenings, face coverings, a favorite of everyone, and then some communication and leadership tips. So again, AYS operates before and after school. We are in central Indiana and we cover about seven school districts across five counties. When we first started, it was one program serving 10 students. Now we are in about 40 programs in a normal year serving about 3,500 students each year. We serve charter schools, 
public schools, parochial schools. Um, our budget's approximately $5 million, and we have approximately 150 or so full and part-time staff who work with kids every day. And our main goal is just to ensure that we're supporting um, learning that's happening in the school day. So we consider ourselves a child care and enrichment program. So we are really child care plus. When you come to a program, it's time to kind of shake off the day from school, um, but then also get some really important reinforcement for what you've learned during that school day and then make sure a healthy snack and that kids have time to connect with their friends and, and, um, and, and feel supported after and before the school day. During this time of COVID, I think uh, Frederick touched on this nicely. We all have to pivot. Pivot is a word that we're hearing all over the place, but really, um, even as a, I think as a teacher or any profession, when you're working with students, you're always trained to make sure you understand the student family need and how to shift that approach. And it's no different now. It's just that the the landscape is much bigger than it was before. I want to touch on just what it's like to learn in the social distancing environment. And so you'll see from these photos, um, something that those of you that are back to school are probably already very familiar with, but one, one tool we've used at AYS is to really physically tape off space for students so that they understand where their kind of little universe in, uh, is and how they can stay safe in their own space. And so um, as we talk about space program, I guess this is really kind of a whole new ball game in some ways for teachers. You, you normally have your classroom set up in a, in a typical way, but now um, um, what I would encourage you to do is to really think about that whole time you're with students and the whole experience of the student's day. So whether they're with you all day or whether they move between classrooms, what kind of space are they going to need to to make their learning most successful? First and foremost, I'd say, you know, you want to think about the big picture of the space and ask questions like, you know, what kind of activities are my kids going to be participating in today? And is it different? You know, is it going to be different the next day or the next week? And then as you're looking at that space is is the classroom your only um, place that you can be or are there other spaces in the building that can provide a safe environment for students that can also kind of mix up the experience and one thing we're recommending and that is being recommended by the CDC is is to really look at outdoor space as a learning environment as well um, while we think of outdoor space as great for recreation it can also be really important for a learning environment we are looking at that space more and trying to get kids outside I encourage you to think about the same thing during the school day. And the one thing that um, being outside can do is it gives kids really a break from those face coverings if they're wearing them all day. So as long as they can stay um, amply apart from one another, it's 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 fa safe to take the face coverings off for a short time. So in space design too, like I said before, making sure that you're taping space off or helping kids create their own space. And I think there's some really great activities that you can do around that um, where you're having kids measure their own space, think about, um, um, what they need to be safe um, while they're learning. Um, and then also school supplies, making sure kids aren't sharing supplies between one another. Um, you want to make sure they have their own basket for their materials and that if they are sharing any supplies, those get wiped off in between. And that's something that we know kids can learn to do and can learn to help take care of their space and their supplies. Frequent hand washing. Um, and if you don't have soap available and water, that you make sure you have hand sanitizer available um, that 60% um, alcohol content or higher. Um, in terms of uh, isol or I think it's oh isolation area. I'm sure each school will have an isolation area designated. If they don't, I highly encourage you to push for that. And what we've done in our program is make sure we have I-95 masks available for staff and students. So when you do have to isolate a student and there's a staff person with them, that just makes everyone a little bit safer during that short period of time when you may or may not know whether or not someone has COVID-19. And then for us in um, after school, and then I think also within school, School buildings. I know a lot of schools have adopted a social emotional learning curriculum. This is very, very important um, as we're learning about safety and as we're experiencing so many other things in our community in terms of racial justice and equities and, and COVID-19. All of those factors really do impact kids and their ability to learn and how they're doing emotionally. And so we want to make sure we're taking care of kids and 
like Frederick said, taking care of ourselves. So um, keeping in mind that we have to keep reinforcing practice makes perfect how to properly wear a face covering. Um, but you'll see the kids here have their arms uh, out. And so some fun things you can do, I think with kids related to personal space is we do helicopter arms or airplane arms if you see kids being too close together or uh, another call out butterfly wings and then kids know how to put their arms out. And that's a good measure of if your arms are um, fully out, then that makes sure and they're not touching the next person, then you're in a safe space. Um, these are things that kids will do with each other too, to self monitor. And we've seen that a lot in our program during this time. So um, just making sure we're monitoring space, that we're practicing face covering, and that we're con constantly reinforcing those positive behaviors in kids is really important. So now I'll move on to cleaning protocols. AYS really pivoted at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, so schools shut down in Indiana at the beginning of March. By April 3rd, we were up and running with pop-up care locations for working families. And then we transitioned and served families all through the summer. So material I'm sharing with you today is is really tested over many, many months of uh, trial and error and learning what works. I'm sure your schools will have very strict protocols, but if they do not, it's something you really want to push for. There's a lot of materials out there. Um, it's very important to know who's cleaning what and when. Um, for AYS, we have clear cleaning logs. We have clear designated responsibilities and, and strong training for staff, and that's something that really should happen during the school day and after school. And then, of course, there's always normal janitorial that happens. I think I think wiping down surfaces between each use, making sure you're cleaning doorknobs, all those things really should be happening throughout the day. Um, so that's pretty cut and dried. One thing that we're doing even with our staff is they they wipe down the bathrooms in between. So when we're in during program, even though normally we wouldn't have that kind of responsibility during this time, it really is important that we're regularly cleaning space after children use it and adults use it. We'll talk again about face coverings. Uh, my biggest advice for anyone who hasn't been wearing them all day long at a, for an extended period of time is make sure you get ones that you really like and that you can breathe in and that you can talk in because when you're wearing them all the time, it's so different than uh, running into the grocery store or running an errand. And um, I remember thinking recently like, wow, now I, I really have a different appreciation for medical professionals who wear these all day long. In our programs, all student and staff are required to wear face coverings. Um, Indiana has some varying requirements. Um, so we we also will tweak our requirements based on what the school day is requiring. So for us, always adults are wearing, but for the students, it's really based on what's happening in the school day because we don't feel like it is uh, appropriate to ask a child to do something different than they were asked to do during the school day. But by and large, uh, most of our staff and all of our staff and most of our kids are wearing face coverings um, throughout the program. There's a link here that you can click on um, that is a, a World Health Organization face covering infographic, and it's really the best one I've seen. You see people wearing their face masks from their ear, you see them wearing them around their neck, you see them hanging them from their car, and what I would say is best practice is when it is not on your face, it's kind of like when glasses aren't on, the, they're in the case. When your face mask isn't on your face, it really should be in a sealed baggie. Mm -hmm. And then you pull it back out when it's time. And then you want to wash the um, cloth mask every single night. So just some things to keep in mind related to face coverings. And again, that infographic um, that was also the pack, but it's on the World Health Organization's website. It's very, very good um, tool that you can use with students as well. I know it's a little it's probably not feasible in every school building to do screenings, but I think the best thing we can do is screen every adult and every child before they enter a building. And so I have seen some schools do this really well. Um, for instance, my son's school has an app you or a forum stack app you fill out the form every morning, record what their temperature is, and ensure that they've uh, checked no to all the boxes, and you submit it, and then he actually shows it um, as he's walking into school. Now, he's in a smaller school, and so that's probably a little easier, but I would encourage school districts to consider some kind of screening, at least, or you're just reminding them to be asking these questions, yeah. and what we don't want is anyone coming to school sick regardless of whether or not you think you have COVID-19, this is a time to be extra cautious about not coming to work ill and not sending a child to work 
ill. Um, so we have a set of questions we ask. There's some very specific standard ones. There is a set of standard recommended questions that you ask adults and children, and then always taking the temperature. Um, we go by a 100.4. Anyone with a higher than 100.4 temperature is not permitted in the program until they um, can come back with a negative test. If there's a positive test or COVID symptoms, there are some real clear recommendations, and, the, and I would consult your local health department on those. For us, we will uh, send a child or a staff home if they have symptoms. Um, if they've tested positive for COVID, they're not able to return until after uh, a, an appropriate quarantine period. That's usually determined by the local health department. And so it's very important that we're in contact regularly with the local health department and they really do recommend um, how to handle um, cases if a positive case is suspected. I would say our uh, experience with families and partners have been very positive when we've asked uh, children not to return to the program, but it is yeah. certainly a difficult conversation to have. So having talking points and knowing where how you escalate is really important. And then we never want to share private information with others. And we always want to protect the, the anonymity of students and their families when we're dealing with health issues. So next, if we go on to communications on the next, I will talk about this from a leader perspective. It's very important to let people know what's happening. And so parents, so whatever you can control in your sphere, make sure you're communicating transparently. If if you're not getting the communication you need from your school officials, I encourage you to ask for that because uh, staff who are informed, parents who are informed, kids who are informed are going to just do better um, in our environments. <laughs> it's just the way it is, I think. Um, yeah. We... Uh, are doing a lot of managing expectations with parents and learning a lot. So one of the things we've learned, and this is probably very true for teachers as well, is that for us especially, we don't allow parents into the space right now and most schools are not also allowing parents in. So we have to remember parents aren't as connected to the classroom day as they used to be. How does you, how does that parent know um, how their child is doing? And so we've adopted some, some old fashioned communicators where we are sending something home so the, because the person who's greeting the parent at pickup or at um, drop-off is not the same person who's with that child all day. And so I think making sure there's that open communication really is important. And then the tips, you know, how do you remind uh, parents to help their kids log on and off a few times on their devices so they know how to do it if we're doing virtual learning, um, making sure they know to bring their extra face covering, that they've practiced wearing it, that they know what social distancing means and that they've practiced doing it. Those are some things that parents can help uh, kids with and help make your jobs a little easier. Again, just keeping channels of communication open. And then I would say in this time, and I think Frederick touched on it too, is that partnerships and leveraging those relationships. So if you've got relationships with your family or your school has relationships with partners, this is a time to really rely on those because yeah. it really does take everybody to keep things going. Finally, just remove barriers. So teachers, you're used to doing this all the time. You know, a student has trouble learning in a certain format, you remove that barrier, you help them find a new way. And I think this is just, there's just a lot more barriers we're going to be facing during this period yeah. of time. And so how do you know what students need? How do you know what your school's expectations are for you? And then what about your colleagues? The other thing I would remind you is be a leader in your school because everybody's going to be going through a lot of stress right now. So how are mm -hmm. you a support system? One of the things we have done um, to, to kind of look at the barriers that are happening is a lot of schools going virtual. We started an e-learning support program. So we're operating full day programs in certain districts where students can go to a space one to 15 per classroom and they can log on and do their social or their um, e-learning with supervision and enrichment wrapped around it while their parents are working. And so it's the same thing schools should really be thinking about is uh, what is going on yeah. again referring back to what Frederick was talking about. I mean, are kids getting enough food? Are their parents working? Do they have support at home to help them with e-learning? If they don't, is there a way to get a program like that started in an empty school building in your district 
or in an empty classroom or two in your building. I do still worry about some of the students if there's a choice between virtual and sending kids to school. Just because you aren't comfortable sending your kid to school doesn't mean you have the resources to make sure they have everything they need yeah. for e-learning, even if they have a computer and Wi-Fi and all those things. We all know e-learning and sitting under in front of a computer from a, for an adult's perspective is very difficult. Imagine if you're six years old and you're required to sit in front of a computer. Mainly my uh, piece on leadership, uh, being flexible, you know, collaborate with others and, um, and inspire each other. So if you don't have a staff, you certainly have people that you're working with and you kind of have to inspire those students too, to want to um, keep learning in this period of time. Everything that you shared was actually really useful. And I have a quick question for you. You spoke about space planning. And, you know, as an elementary special education teacher, most of my instruction would occur at a kidney table within close proximity to a small group of students. So for teachers who are still expected to provide small group instruction, whether it be for reading or math or intervention, do you have any tips on how to do that safely? So, I mean, I, I wonder what the ratio, what are the ratios typically in a special ed classroom? Um, typically about one teacher to about four or five kids. I think that's that's doable. Um, probably rather than having kids at one table, maybe having five tables still fa all facing forward okay. but six six three to six feet apart and if so if you had small desk and you can still you could have them in a rounded format but i would just make sure that they're properly spaced apart and that the teacher is able to be a little further away again if students are wearing face coverings then you do have that opportunity to get a little closer and interact but right. you also want to try to maintain as much space as possible Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much for that insight and for all the information that you shared. I know schools, teachers, everyone will be able to utilize it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Strubin. Um, next, you. we will hear from Dr. Fesich. Um, she is an assistant professor of education and instructional technologist at Grove City College, and she will be sharing different tips for collaborative technology that you can use, whether you're in person or if you're doing distance learning. So I will let you take it away. Thank you so much, Mandy Jane. Hey yeah. guys, I'm Dr. Sam Fesich. I'm a professor at Grove City College where I have the honor and the privilege of working with future teachers every day, all about ed tech and some intro to special ed. So former special ed teacher here, I'm feeling you there on Mandy Jane on that one. <laughs> And I also get to uh, work with a couple of our student teachers. So using educational technology is critical, extra critical now um, in COVID-19 um, times. I'm also uh, the author of EduMagic, Guide for Pre-Service Teachers, and host the EduMagic podcast, which is a podcast just for future educators. So check it out. Before we get into our talk about EdTech, we really need to think about what Frederick shared and what Crystal shared, having those safe environments, those safe spaces for our students, having that mindset mindset of Maslow before Blooms. We have to focus on our students' needs. We have to know our students. We have to know our school, families, and community and support them and raise them up because as educators, we are leaders and we are helpers and we need to support our students and their families as well. Then we can talk about that educational technology. So friends, whether you were teaching 100% online this year, or hybrid, or a little bit of both, or some sort of other combination that I haven't even thought of yet, please know that you are an educator of excellence. You can do this. You are a teacher. We can do this. And we are all stronger together. There's a beautiful community out on KDP that you can um, get support from. They can support you, challenge you, encourage you along the way. So please, we're all better together. Go out there. You can do this. We got this. We are educators of excellence. So let's jump into our presentation for tonight. But before we get into the different tools I want to demo for you tonight, and these are just really quick sneak peeks of the tools tonight, friends, got to talk about some terminology. So if you are a child of the 90s, you can raise your hand on this one. I am. I love, um, I'm a huge fan of NSYNC. And this is what I always think of when I think of those two terms, synchronous and asynchronous. NSYNC, they were always, you know, on the same beat. They're doing their dances and their songs are always moving together. That's synchronous learning. You're in that learning space together, whether it's virtual or face-to-face. Uh, -face. You're meeting at the same time, same place, kind of like that old thing, like same to same bat time, same bat channel. Thing. You're a synchronous learning at the same time. Asynchronous 
again, back to the 90s, think of that Backstreet Boys, you can go, students can go back to the learning at their own time. They can go forward um, in, their own, in their own learning. It's self, more self-paced, it's more self-guided, it's at their own time, at their own pace. And I believe Frederick mentioned in the beginning of our session, maybe depending on their age and their grade level, they might be chiming in or tuning into the learning maybe later in the afternoon or early during the day, depending on their schedule and availability. So that's asynchronous learning. And collaboration is another term we're going to be talking about tonight. And that's one of those four C's. There's four C's, creativity, communication, collaboration, and critical thinking. And the collaboration is just one of those things. It's a 21st century learning skill. And it's something all of our students need to know how to do because it's one of those soft skills that we got to do every day, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. It's working together towards the same goal. So some of the tools I'm going to show you tonight, all of them are free or they're, they're free or there's a paid version. I tell my students all the time, sometimes teachers need to specialize in free because we are all about those free tech tools. And I'm so excited to share some of those with you tonight. So friends, I don't know about you, but sitting in Zoom meetings, Teams meetings, Google Meets, all the meets, um, can be a little tiring where we're looking at the same PowerPoint templates and the same Google Slides. So I have a couple of things I want to show you tonight to kind of add some spice or sprinkle some um, some beautiful rainbow sprinkles on your donut of your presentation. So we're going to be talking about some ways you can really jazz it up. The first thing I want to show you tonight is uh, Microsoft Sway. This is a free tool. You can access it uh, Office 365. What's neat about it is it's just a different way to present content. You can have content look like this. You can have it look like a website. You can have content fly in and animate as you go through. You can link to videos, images, have links in there, text, and all sorts of things embedded within your Microsoft Sway. Amazing. And it's just a other, it's just a neat way to present content differently than a PowerPoint or a Google slide. But if you are all about those Google slides and PowerPoints, friends, I have some cool tools to help you out to jazz up those presentations because sometimes they might need a little bit of work. Slides Carnival, I learned about this from one of my students. Probably many of them told me about this. Um, and it's a really neat way to just grab a really cool um, template and it'll pull in. You can download them as Google slides or as PowerPoint. The next one I want to share is Slides Mania. And this is like my new favorite of so they have a little education tab and this is all free as well. The person who created this, I think her name is Paula. She has amazing educational templates. So there's notebook style. And if you're all about those planners, future teachers listening, I know you're all about those planners because I see you with them all the time. They have little digital ones that you can download and update and put all your own stuff in there. You can have like the old school little composition notebook. Um, and you can also put your content in here to present to your students. They also have really cool choice boards and games so you can share these out with your students um, to use as well um, yeah it, it's it's just there's so much on here and I feel like every time I go to it there's always something new that I can find on here so if I click on choice boards here we go I have a little filing cabinet I can do a little treasure hunt for students and you can download these just as you would um, the other one and you can download as PowerPoint or Google Slides and here they give you some really cool activities, really nice way for you to frame your content in logical ways and have um, links to different pages. It is super cool. I really like Slides Mania. And like I said, like I go to it like all the time. <laughs> the next one I want to share with you is Buncee. So I know you guys have seen those Bitmoji classrooms floating all around. Um, <laughs> Uh, Buncee does have some backgrounds that you could use, but they also have some really cool tools for you to create content. And all these tools that I'm showing you tonight, your students can create too. So just because you're creating it for content for them to consume, also have them use it to create content for you. So have them be creative, create some really cool stuff for them to use. So here's a really quick all about me and students can go in and add content within here. Um, you know, you can totally rock that Bitmoji classroom if you want to rock that as well. Just a neat little intro slide and you can add in lots of things to your Buncee. You can do text and shapes and 3Ds and 
little animated stickers and you can have them go into a YouTube video. You can upload your own content as well and throw it in here. So it is a really unique thing uh, to use in the classroom for students to create with. Maybe instead of writing a paper um, or a five paragraph essay, they can create a Buncee uh, that shows you know the topics that you want them to, to understand from that lesson. So yeah, so there's some really cool stuff within Buncee. You can use it for yourself or for your students, just like with the other tools I showed you. Yes. Um, the next one that I want to show is Canva. Canva has amazing things. I, do, I love Canva, first of all, but it has some great education content. And you can sign up for a free educator account. Um, they have lesson plans, and I know that, you know, some people are really rocking those lesson plans, but they have them in an organized way. So they have block planning, and they have, you know, the, the regular lesson plan template. So there's some really cool ways you can jazz up your lesson plans, but you can also do presentations within here as well. You can create a class schedule, so there's presentations that you can do, so you can jazz up um, um, your, your, your presentations with Canva and students can also create within Canva with your education account. You can have a classroom and students can submit their work there so they can create social media posts, they can create flyers, they can create digital content that can show what they know in some really cool ways. Um, and then the last tool to spice up those uh, presentations would be Adobe Spark. Adobe Spark, you can do a post, you can do a page, um, or you can do a video. And a video is really cool because it walks you through the entire process of creating your video. It's like, what kind of video do you, do you want to make? Do you want to do a call to action? Do you want to do a story video? And it'll walk you through and give you steps along the way of how to complete it. You can pull in your own images. What's neat about this is um, it'll, it'll animate as you go. It'll pull in pictures. You can throw in links and headings. Um, Lots of really cool stuff within Adobe Spark and share that out with your students. You can share a link, you can share it out into the LMS as well. So we know that with our students, we need to engage them in learning. Try to engage my students every three to four slides when we're doing virtual learning. Two tools that do this really well. Uh, one is Nearpod and one is Pear Deck. Uh, so within Nearpod, I can add in my, so I just uploaded my Google slide presentation right within Nearpod. And now I'm just gonna add in some cool content that I want my students to interact with. So I can add in videos. I can make my own slides within Nearpod, but mm, I think I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna create it in something else and bring it into here. Um, I can pull in my FET simulations. I can do a virtual field trip for my math teachers out there. We have our graphing calculator. I can pull in a website so they're not all bebopping somewhere online where I don't know where they are. I can have my web content and they click on it and they go exactly where I, they need to go. Or so they're not anywhere weird. Um, you can also embed a Sway like we talked about, uh, the first tool that we talked about. But what I really like about Nearpod are the activities. And this is where you can do some checks for understanding, do a quick poll to see how the students are doing to get kind of a temperature of the room on that topic or just social emotional. Um, you can do collaboration boards and drawing boards as well. Flipgrid is fantastic for video content. You can have students record their own video, um, responding to a prompt that you provide them. You can embed that right within Nearpod, which is super cool. And Time to Climb, which college students go crazy for. It is so much fun. So it's a little multiple choice uh, test where they're um, competing against each other. They have to climb up the Himalayan mountains or something like that. So that's always a lot of fun at the end of a lesson. But what's nice about Nearpod is everyone's on the same slide at the same time. So if I'm on slide three, I know all of my students are on slide three. They're not on slide five or slide one. I can also quickly add in content as I'm teaching, which is fantastic. Uh, Pear Deck is another tool, same thing. You can upload your presentations within here and you can add in content. What I like about Pear Deck, it has fantastic social emotional templates that you can use. They also have templates for math, critical thinking, science, so you can pull from there as well. It talks to Office 365, so you can just pull that add in or add on and you can embed your Pear Deck presentation uh, questions within there. So here we have stuff stru structured for beginning of class questions during and uh, end of class. I love this stress check. I kind of like, I think I might use this, you know, if I'm teaching face-to-face -face or virtual because mm -hmm. it gives me a nice temperature of the room. And if my students are sevens and eights up here, I can go and I can direct message them because it keeps track of their data as they answer questions. So if I see that they're a seven or an eight after class, I can check in, hey, what's going on? How can I help you? 
um, you know, that type of stuff. And then we also have some other types of prompts that you can pull in here. Students can drag a dot across the screen to agree or disagree. We could do our good old Venn diagram um, and multiple choice. So that's Pear Deck. And then there's another uh, collaboration tool, which is super cool. And it's really grown a lot in the past couple of years since I've used it. And it's called Padlet. And you can have, I think it's up to three boards for free. And this is a link that you just send out to your students. And it's a virtual bulletin board where they can put sticky notes on. They can like each other's comments. Um, and you can add in a whole bunch of stuff instead of just text. So I tell my students, if you feel like you can't express yourself in words, express yourself in a video or in a link <laughs> or in an image. And then they can pop all that in there. A voice recording is also super fun too. And a drawing. And they can like each other's comments. And so you can upvote as well within Padlet too. Um, one last tool that I have for you all is Microsoft has a whiteboard app and I just um, recently found that they have little templates within here so this is nice for a reflection piece you can have uh, you can share this with your with uh, with your colleagues you can share this with your mentor teacher with your students too this is just a little reflection example but I can go in and I can um, add in stickers I can have a word doc where maybe we're collaborating on I can have um, little post-it notes within here. I don't know about you, but I, I sometimes see post-it notes all over laptops or, or <laughs> little sticky notes all over laptops. Um, and they have other really cool templates here. So they have brainstorming that you can share with students, uh, reflective pieces, those types of things. So that's Microsoft Whiteboard. And then the last one is OneNote. Now OneNote is like a session within itself. So I'm just gonna quickly mm -hmm. talk about, you can share pages, you can share notebooks, but they also have amazing templates for documenting homework and for students who are learning virtually, you might want to have something like this structured notes uh, for them. Uh, so you can share this page with them or as a teacher, you can create something like this for your students and share with them after. So they have a little checklist of stuff that they need to, you know, work on for the next class. But within OneNote, you can collaborate with your students, students can collaborate with one another. Um, you can also do a little check boxes to check things off. And that was really fast. And that's all I have, friends, for EdTech Tools. If you want to chat about anything, hit me up over on Twitter or Instagram. I'm at SFESich, and I'd love to connect and see all the cool stuff that you're implementing in your classroom. And KDP, thanks for this awesome opportunity. This is a rocking webinar. Thank you. Well, awesome job, Dr. Fessich. I definitely can see you gaining a lot of followers after this evening. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have you know one. goals in life. <laughs> <laughs> I have one quick question. Um, well, actually, it's like a two-part quick question. But what would be a piece of collaborative technology that could be used well for little students, like you're younger, like maybe like first kindergarten? Mm -hmm. And what type of accessibility tools would you recommend for students with disabilities? Great question. I'm yeah. so glad you asked that. All right, mm -hmm. so for the little ones, I would recommend... Um, just very simply uh, a OneNote page that you can share okay. out with your students across across your LMS um, or you can do something quick within Padlet because you have that drawing option there too yeah. and then accessibility oh my gosh Mandy Jane there is a tool called immersive reader and it's through mm -hmm. Microsoft it is free it works across platforms. and some of the tools that I showed you tonight like Buncee and um, Nearpod I believe Pear Deck, they work with an immersive reader. They do text-to-speech. There's um, contrast that you can change with the fonts. You can change the font size. It's a beautiful tool that can be used to um, really level that playing field when it comes to accessing the digital content. So, yay, great question. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. And I, I look forward to people being able to ask you more questions towards the end. So we will kind of switch gears over to Ms. Caldwell. Ms. Caldwell will definitely be sharing some great insight on making that shift from in-person teaching to e-learning and how to do it the most efficiently. So Ms. Caldwell, please introduce yourself and take it away. Now we can, there you go. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brittany Caldwell and I am a social studies and special education teacher at Cedar Grove High School in Atlanta, Georgia. I am a fourth year teacher. This is my fourth year teaching. I did two years of student teaching. So I feel like I've been teaching for a good amount of time. And yeah, I'm just one of the many teachers who are dealing with COVID. Yeah. And it's been very stressful. Um, it's been very stressful. We're getting through it. But like I said, I'm here to provide ways to make it an easier transition for teachers. 
So the first thing really is adapting um, your lesson plans from in-person to virtual. A lot of teachers um, have relied on using these same kind of lesson plans throughout, you know, how teachers find things that work for them, things that they're used to dealing with, that you're comfortable doing um, as you go on throughout the year. So some teachers really are, that's the biggest challenge for them is trying to convert that in-person instruction into virtual. Um, I definitely believe one thing that makes it easier is to sit down and really assess everything that you have. Um, ask yourself, can this easily be formatted or redesigned? Um, what do I need to make from scratch, right? Don't start over from the drawing board. Think about things that you love to do in your classroom in person and just simply how you can utilize different apps online. Um, one thing, that I have definitely relied on is the teacher community. Mm -hmm. Is at um, KDP has really opened a lot of communication with me and teachers from all around America. Um, Instagram, just finding people through hashtags has been a game changer for me. Um, so a lot of these things that I'm even talking about today, I've learned from other teachers who I've just met and talked with, um, Facebook group communities. So those type of things as well, just reaching out and asking. Um, decide how you will be running your classroom. Um, some people have more synchronous based class, more blended. Once you know exactly how you want your classroom to go, it'll be easier for you to search for certain assignments or kind of group the assignments that you already have into those groups. Um, chunking your learning objectives. The amount of attention that we get from students online is way lower yeah. than in person. It's very hard to keep their attention online. And I was um, talking to my students online. I can like see him veering off, you know, like yeah. he's going away. <laughs> yeah, we as teachers, you've got to be more intentional with what you're teaching when it comes to online. Um, that's chunking your learning objectives and your standards and units into reasonable bits that are small enough to keep attention and get the information across. Um, utilizing apps. So she mentioned all of the apps that I love. There's so many applications that are available right now and um, resources that mirror your teaching style specific. I'm really into integrating STEM into history. Mm -hmm. And there's so many activities online where I can focus lessons on that. Some people like musical history, concentration, mixing it up. There's a lot of different resources. Um, still use apps, like I said, use apps and resources to mirror your style so that not every single class has to be the same, even though you guys are teaching the same content. There's definitely a lot of ways to still keep your personalized teacher identity through virtual instruction. Um, restructuring your formal and informal assessments is definitely important because it's very easy, easy for students to Google information. That is one of the biggest issues many of us face. Um, I've had to go through and re kind of shape the way that I test my children. Multiple choice is not really the best when yeah. it's online. Yeah, I know that as a college student, we had a professor who would lock our browser down but you know public schools are not afforded yeah. we, we don't have that. so i have yeah. just given up on multiple choice testing for the most part for now and have come up with like constructed question type question um essay projects right other forms of formal assessment um one major thing is increasing engagement it can be very awkward when you're like going live talking to your students and it's just blank like crickets <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah you're like give me a thumbs up if you hear me and like a bunch of thumbs up but it's silent so i actually just started my first week this week mm. um i just met my students yesterday and I've just been doing a lot of activities to help us build a community, um, make us feel like we know each other, even though we don't, you know, um, build, give them something to be excited about coming to class, um, message board, common social media hashtag. We made a remind group just so we can kind of like text each other quickly instead of having to go through teams. I think it's yeah. definitely important. those same activities that you do 
at the beginning of the school year can translate online. And it also increases accountability because when students know that other people know them and are aware of them and can notice when they're not there, I feel like they feel more waking up and showing up to class. Yeah. And that's the hardest part. Um, they've actually been hounding, I teach high school, so they've been hounding first period teachers because if you can get the child to show up for first period virtually, they'll be up and show up for the other periods, you know, but that's one issue that a lot of teachers I've seen complaining about is a lack of attendance online yeah. from some children. And it's very hard to equate attendance and attentiveness right now during this time. Um, as I mentioned in the slide before, shortening the content, trying to keep it between five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I try to get as much information out to them as quickly as I can and not make it too lengthy. That's a lot of the hassle when you start losing them. So in order to increase engagement, just make sure the lectures aren't too long. Um, a lot of front loading, which most teachers should be classroom, right? Um, allow them to acquire that content on their own so that when you do get to them virtually, you can spend time talking about things and, um, you know, really engaging with the content instead of a video that they could have watched to learn before they entered your virtual classroom, right? Um, increasing face-to-face -face through allowing students to speak as we are right now. I know a lot of students do not feel comfortable with video. So I just encourage them instead of having the little initial circle, like at least make a bitmoji for me. So you can have so much fun with virtual learning. And I think there's actually more options for learning. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like it's easier for me to really manage my students even from my computer and being able to kind of check on them all in one space versus being overstimulated, trying to chase everyone around my classroom. And it's easier mm -hmm. for me to manage. So it just depends on how you look at it. Definitely require your students to do, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide when it comes to translating Bloom's taxonomy into virtual. Yeah. Avoid monotonous assignments. I have made it my mission to do my assignments that I assign before I give it to them to see if it's awful for me to do. So if it's awful for you to do, do not assign it to your children. It's not going to be engaging. If you can't get through it as a specialist in your content, they are not going to get through it or be engaged all the way. Um, and provide opportunities for collaboration. I actually met a U.S. history teacher from California mm -hmm. on Instagram. And we became friends and we decided that we were actually going to join our class together mm -hmm. and assign one of his children to one of my children to work on a project cross country from one another. Yeah, and it actually went really well. So collaboration is important in just 21st century learning in general today. Yeah. So many jobs are virtual 100%. So this is actually a really good opportunity to teach children real authentic 21st century skills because, you know, like I tell my kids, one day you could be working with someone in China and you're never gonna see them. You're going to have to make it work and you can, yeah, you can definitely add that into your instruction as a teacher, keeping students engaged and they don't want to just listen to you talk all the time. Give them time, just like in class where they would sneak and talk to each other, you know, <laughs> allow them to talk to each other online as well by giving them collaboration time. Nice. So for teachers, um, I know I was obsessed with Bloom's taxonomy because of my TEKS, my teacher evaluations. <laughs> You want to um, you want to make sure that you're keeping your students engaged through giving them authentic learning opportunities. As you see at the bottom of the pyramid, remembering, understanding, applying. So this is just like fill in the blank or find the definition or um, just kind of the easier side of learning. It's really easy to run to that when you're virtual. Yeah. Or have students do the easy things, but as far as creating very rigorous online learning, which is them creating blogs, them collaborating, stimulating, they can still do role-playing activities through the virtual learning, podcasting, um, wiki building, debating. One of the things that I relied heavily on in my class was Socratic seminars, 
and I actually just perfected and um, wrote out exactly how I can still do a Socratic seminar online, which is kind of even what similar to what we're doing today, right? But yeah, so there's a lot of options that you could do with children that are not just the same boring activities and still challenge yourself as a teacher to make sure that you're keeping that Bloom's taxonomy level high at all times. So here's just some verbs teachers can kind of check out later to just kind of like spark some creativity in different content areas. Assessing student attentiveness during virtual instruction. This is actually, this was a hot debate. Um, on, on this Instagram page, it was actually a hot debate. We were questioning whether students should be required to have their video on. In my county, teachers are required. Mm -hmm. Of course, so I have to go live with my students face-to-face, -face, regardless of if they are face-to-face -face with me, for 30 minutes for every block three times a day, so virtually 90 minutes. And they were, a lot of teachers just felt like if a teacher has to show, a student should have to show accountability as well, or I do not agree with that at all. Um, I don't think that it's necessary. And I also think to even in college, when you're taking college courses, your professor may go live and you'll have videos, but they don't require you to do that. It's not necessary to ensure instruction, I don't believe. And some people just do not want to show their face. One thing teachers have to do is make sure that you're not aligning your personal opinions on that into instruction or gauging student attentiveness. Do not remove students from virtual class meetings if their videos are not on. Don't um, kind of trick students with, oh, class dance party or you know points for this and that. A easy way to make sure that your students are paying attention without necessarily having their video is to do the real time check in. When I'm on Microsoft Teams with my kids. Thumbs up if you can hear me, you know, um, hand, hand up if I'll spot call on the list. Sometimes when I have my list of students, I'll just randomly say, okay, well, Mike, you can kind of gauge if somebody is listening, otherwise being able to see their face. So that's a part of real time check in, ask questions as you're teaching here. It suggests polls, um, any type of nonverbal reactions, use that chat box and you can ask questions. student choice. It's just important to let them decide at this time. I have so many children dealing with anxiety. These are suffering and I've tried my hardest to just be as flexible as possible because they're anxious and they're sad and you know, they're missing on, I teach juniors and seniors and they're missing out on the, be the best years of high school, you know? So be flexible. If your students don't wanna be on a big deal, respect their choice, um, suggest, like I said, a Bitmoji or virtual background or just something different, but definitely allow your students to have a choice. Use digital assessment tools, Google Forms, um, polls. There's a lot of different ways that you could go around it. And this matters because students definitely deserve privacy. One thing that we suffer with in the cab is equity. And you just mm -hmm. don't know what someone's house looks like, sounds like, how they feel. You know, um, we, we don't know what these kids are dealing with. And you just have to be flexible. That's yeah. one thing I encourage with teachers during this time. At the end of the day, all the small things like my kids, if you tell me that you're trying and you're engaged, we're going to work through this because I am experiencing anxiety myself as a teacher. Yeah. I can only imagine what my students who also have four to five classes are dealing with. And I'm dealing, I teach the same subject in all classes. I can only imagine how they go juggling all the things. <laughs> Um, like I said, for more tips and examples, feel free to follow my classroom Instagram or email me anytime. I thoroughly enjoy helping new teachers. I have met so many teachers online, and I think that this is a positive time for us to actually use this as a tool to become better educators. The world is transitioning online. So I try to see the, sil the silver lining in all of this COVID stuff. It's, it's <laughs> awful. It's a tragedy, but it actually can really expand you as an educator. And I know yeah. as educators, a lot of us get so comfortable, and this is uncomfortable. 
-hmm. It's very uncomfortable and it's taken a lot of us out of our shell. But I think that a lot of the things that we are dealing with now, there will be no turning back. And at least every single classroom will have to become somewhat blended, even if we go back to in person. If you've already put in the legwork to go virtual, I'm sure a lot of teachers will keep using it and the classroom and become blended. So those are my tips just as far as making instruction easier in the classroom when you're going virtual. And thank you, each and everything that you shared is so useful, Ms. Caldwell. So thank you, thank you. All right, friends, I know there was so much information shared in that webinar. You might have to go back and listen to it twice. I would like to end our time today with some concluding thoughts that I had to share at the end of this webinar. I think we can all be brave and nervous at the same time. We are truly going into uncharted territory here, and it is, it's okay to be brave and to be nervous and to be excited and to be anxious, feeling all those feelings, but being who you are as a teacher, being authentically you and bringing that to the classroom, showing up for your students each day, being the teacher that you are meant to be is, I think, the greatest gift that you can give your students this fall. There you have it, Edu Magicians. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. For more Edu Magic, check out sfesage.com and follow Dr. Sam on Twitter and Instagram at sfesage. Until next time, you have the Edu Magic within you.